Today I would like to welcome Professor Tommy Wheatman. Tommy is a distinguished professor at the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering and also leader of the Sustainability Assessment Program at UNSW. In recent years, Tommy has spent a considerable amount of time of, on reflecting on how we can create a well-being economy and how human and planetary well-being can be achieved, achieved at the same time. Tommy is one of the top cited academics at UNSW with over 20,000 citations and the H index that most of us can't even dream about. But apart from all these amazing academic achievements, what I believe makes Tommy a truly outstanding pioneer is his courage to research, discuss and publish on some of the inconvenient and in fact uncomfortable topics that not many like to deal with. For example, in one of his recent publications called Effluence is Killing the Planet. I'm very excited to have Tommy here today and to learn from him about some of his most recent insights and findings. And with this, I would like to pass things on to Tommy, who will present today on scientists warning on affluence, implications for renewable energy. Go ahead, Tommy. Okay, thank you very much, Oli, and uh, thanks for inviting me to this. It's a pleasure. I really uh, like to present on this topic and, and thanks for the introduction as well. So I would also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land I'm presenting from today, which are the Viradjuri people of the Central West region. I live just west of the Blue Mountains. And I would also like to acknowledge that um, Oliver himself and also Erin Ramblands provided some inputs to and, and ideas and thoughts and suggestions to this presentation. So it's a, it's a bit of a collective work there. Um, yeah, this is the, a, a nice opportunity to present uh, a paper that, uh, as Oliver said, we published a couple of years ago, I, I think it was 2020, and uh, it's still very topic, and I think it, it that, that topic won't go away. So uh, what I would like to do now is uh, present the slides, um, which should be about something like 30 to 40 minutes. And then we can have a discussion about it. I hope there will be enough time. Please do interrupt me if there is a technical problem or if you have any immediate questions, I don't mind. Um, just, you know, um, interrupt me straight away and we can clarify things straight away. So otherwise, I, I, um, I note that my slides are shared, I think. I just need to move on to the next one. Yep. Yeah. And uh, so I would like to elaborate a little bit on, on the problem that we are facing at humanity and then look at possible responses and then have a, a final section on what we can do next as researchers mostly. So it's mostly for an academic uh, uh, public here. So we are living in the Anthropocene, uh, as some people call it. Uh, sometimes it's also called the Great Acceleration. And basically that means that every issue to do with humanity has accelerated over the last 200 years or so. And that's really, really to do mostly with an exponential growth in uh, the human population. So human population, urban population. Let me just get a pointer here and I can point a few things out. Um, so human population, urban population um, has grown, our economies have grown, uh, we have used more resources, more water, we have, you know, produced more cement and steel, we've used more energy, which is maybe interesting in this context with renewable energy here. And all of these are exponentially growing. And we also see when we look at indicators from the natural world or ecological indicators, we see that uh, the biosphere um, well, that there are impacts on biodiversity, that the surface and the ocean temperature is rising, as we know, and then carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions are rising in, in pretty much in line with that. Now, you, I'm sure you have all heard about the planetary boundaries framework, which was introduced by Earth system scientists back in 2009. It's a, a very good concept. It's still academically refined. So we will we will continue to see improvements on that. And basically, the question that was asked there was to what limits will the Earth system be able to absorb anthropogenic pressure? without compromising living conditions of the human species. So how, how, how far can we push the Earth basically without compromising our own uh, survival? And uh, what 
uh, was clear from the beginning is that we had already crossed some of those planetary boundaries. That is, we are in a zone of high risk or irreversible damage. And back in the day, there were four boundaries already transgressed or in the process of being crossed uh, climate change, biosphere integrity, which includes biodiversity and land use change and biochemical flows, which include phosphorus and nitrogen, which of course is uh, mostly to do with agricultural and land use as well. Now, fast forward to 2022, and there are now six boundaries that have been confirmed to be transgressed. Just recently, earlier this year, I think that was in April, Novel Entities was confirmed to have been crossed. That includes um, all the man-made substance we put into the natural world. So chemicals, but also plastic pollution, for example, which everyone knows about. Um, and just a month or two months ago, um, the green water boundary has also been confirmed as having been transgressed. So there is um, a, a new findings there. Um, a few of the other ones are not uh, quantified yet, but apparently, and that's what Erin told us, um, Professor Will Steffen, uh, who is one of the co-authors there, said at a talk at UNSW last year that a seventh boundary, ocean acidification, that's this one here, is being peer-reviewed as having been crossed too. So there is profound pressure on natural systems from humans. Uh, we see this everywhere across the globe. This is just an example from Australia. You have probably seen that in the conversation last year, but it's also being confirmed in the State of the Environment report, which was just published um, a couple of weeks ago, that we are seeing profound impacts on ecosystems. They show sign of collapse. Uh, they are in the process of collapsing. And uh, scientifically confirmed are 19 of those ecosystems across Australia, you know, reaching from the Great Barrier Reef in the north to the kelp forests in the south and then to um, other reefs in, in the west that are uh, in the process of changing uh, profoundly and irreversibly. So there is, and, and that, you know, that's reflected across the world. Obviously, we have problems in, in all other parts of the world as well, mostly to do with climate change, but not only to do with climate change. So um, we all remember the Black Summer bushfires from 2019, 2020. I'm sure that everyone here on the talk uh, was affected in one way or another. There was just no escaping, really. And um, I'm also sure that um, for, for some people that was a wake up call. It was for me, although I, I knew about uh, environmental problems since I had been a teenager. But, um, you know, to live through it and to see through it, that, that's a, a different thing yet. And, and it was very clear, you know, this is the world we're living in now. Um, this is here. This is happening. And the only thing we can do uh, to try and do is to make sure that it doesn't get much, much worse. So this is really basically the situation we are in. Just brief update on the IPCC uh, report that you know was published earlier this year, the sixth assessment report. In terms of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, what we put out globally, it doesn't look good. So this is the curve until 2019. Um, when we reached a record high of 59 gigatons of uh, CO2 equivalents emissions globally, mostly from fossil fuel burning, but also from agriculture and land use, so methane and nitrous oxide emissions. And um, yeah, this uh, had a little dip in uh, 2020 when we had COVID, so around 5 to 7% uh, emissions went down, but then 2021 they went uh, straight back up again and we are, we are basically at the same level now and we still haven't turned the curve we still haven't bent the curve yet i will talk a little bit more about that so um optimists would uh, point to the fact that the growth in emissions was in over the last 10 years was only 1.3 percent compared to 2.1 percent the decade before so that um, the growth is slowing but i'm not sure whether that's a lot of comfort when you actually know that the curve has to go down and not not just growing less fast um 
also related to the IPCC report that was an accompanying paper that we published um, was about, you know, looking uh, over the last 30 years of the main drivers. And again, this is not really new, I suppose, if you know the IPAD equation or the, the Kaya decomposition of um, CO2 emissions in this case. So this is the the blue green curve here. It's a bit obscured, but but that's basically growing um, up to this point. Um, and that has been decomposed into the main factor contributing. Um, as you can see, I'll just go through them quickly. So we have energy efficiency, which means the amount of energy we use per unit of GDP, gross domestic product, uh, has gone down. So we have become more energy efficient, but that was counteracted by all the other factors. So that would have reduced emissions if nothing else had changed. Then uh, we have CO2 per unit of energy. This is basically where renewable energy comes in, right? So how much CO2 we release by producing one unit of energy. And you can see that this has basically not changed over the last 30 years. It's coming down now um, a bit more with renewable energy, but you know this, this should really be way down low. Um, and then increasing emissions, of course, are population, and um, GDP per population, so this is basically um, gross domestic product or wealth per person. And you can see that these are both drivers. Um, wealth or uh, GDP per population is almost twice as strong a driver than population. But both are driving emissions up, and that's why we see emissions increase. So there's another picture which I just want to show briefly. This is a longer time span from 1960. Um, it, does, it only goes to 2016, but it basically shows the same. Uh, the iPad equation impacts is population times effluence, what you would could say GDP per capita times technology, which is basically our carbon and energy intensity. But what I would like to point out on this slide is really when you look at those two curves, GDP per capita, green, and CO2 emissions, red, that they are in sync, right? This is This is basically following straight. So there's no um, decoupling. I will come to decoupling in the next few slides. So it, it's just looking at this graph, you know, tells you a, a, a very strong story about what is actually driving greenhouse gas emissions and, and other environmental impacts. So another just quick thing um, I, I thought is worth, uh, worth pointing out from the IPCC report was that um, we have already uh, used up pretty much the budget for keeping uh, global warming to within 1.5 degrees Celsius because we have already committed existing and planned fossil fuel infrastructure. So those two graphs here um, are the um, existing uh, fossil fuel infrastructure um, emissions that are coming up from electricity and from other sectors. And you can see those together are already above the um, around 500 gigatons of CO2 equivalents uh, of budget for the 1.5 degree scenarios. And then on top of that, there are some proposed uh, coal and gas projects that together would then uh, get very close to the two degree uh, Celsius scenario. So we have already committed to a lot of warming and um, well, well, we'll discuss what, what we should do to avoid that. Um, here is a curve that's a um, couple of years old. It's not the most recent one, but I like this graph because it's very graphic. It shows basically what would happen in terms of global warming if there were no climate policies at all. Um, what would happen if we implement all the current policies and what would happen if we uh, implement all the pledges that were made in terms of net zero emissions from governments, you know, for example, from COP27. So this graph was uh, produced before COP27 and we are a bit further down. So with the pledges, we will definitely get below three degrees, but we will would still be above two degrees Celsius. So just imagine all those curves slightly bit further down. But what remains the fact is that that we need to get to this level here in terms of emissions in order to have any chance to limit global warming. And what is also worth pointing out on this slide is where we are at the moment. So we are 2022 and we are around 60 gigatons of CO2. So we are here, if you can see that cursor, we are here 
and um, that's sitting in the orange field, right? So I don't think I need to comment any more on that. And um, also this graph, some of you might have seen this. Um, again, I, I just um, show this always because this is so striking. Um, it basically shows, you know, um, if, well, we have to say here that this graph does not take into account negative emissions or what's also called carbon dioxide removal from the atmosphere. So taking it out or sequestering carbon dioxide. If we um, put this aside for a moment, um, but just look at what would have to happen with greenhouse gas emissions um, if we wanted to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, then if we had started reducing our emissions 20 years ago, around, 20, uh, around 2000, we would have had to mitigate uh, with about 4% per year. That's, that's already quite um, difficult, but it would have been, you know, still feasible. Now, we haven't done anything for the last 20 years globally. Basically, we're still growing emissions or we're still at this level. So that means that obviously we would have to reduce much further now, something like 18% per year. Um, if, we, if we don't do anything in the next few years, in the next 10 years or so, then basically we, you know, we, we have used up the budget. So that the, the sobering fact here is that that's not possible anymore. Um, it's not just not achievable. That's even if we put everything onto it, uh, there wouldn't be enough time to achieve that. So that basically without negative emissions, that is pulling CO2 from the atmosphere, um, there's no way we can we, we can uh, get to 1.5 degrees Celsius. <clears throat> I'm just checking in briefly that technically everything's okay. You can still hear me and um, everyone's happy at the other end. Um, I, yeah, all good. Okay, good. Uh, I don't um, have a look at the chat because I'm just looking at the presentation. But if there, are, as I say, if there are any immediate questions, just let me know. Okay, so good. Well, this question, why haven't we bent the, the curve? Um, the IPCC actually has uh, a, a paragraph on this. You will not find this in the summary for policymakers, but in the technical summary on page 130, you would, will find this uh, paragraph, which says that basically obstacles to bend the curve uh, include both entrenched power relations dominated by vested interests that control and benefit from existing technologies and governance structures that continue to reproduce unsustainable patterns of production and consumption. So um, the whole fossil fuel machinery is so implemented in everything and, and you know, uh, in our economy, but also in our daily lives that, that this is just um, not something that can easily and quickly be changed. Um, there, there's another sentence which I just bring up, although this, this is not directly related to this, this may be something for later, uh, because it talks about solutions. Sustainable solutions require adoption and mainstreaming of locally novel technologies that can meet local needs and simultaneously address the sustainable development goals. Um, so, I just thought I'd bring this up because this points to, for example, energy community projects being one of the possible solutions in the context of renewable energy. I thought this would be, you know, interesting to mention that that this is explicitly mentioned here. There is a very good paper that was published last year, which. Uh, exactly asks the same question, why haven't we bent the global emissions curve? And I can really recommend this paper because it's, it's a really thorough literature review over the last 30 years, you know, since the IPCC was implemented. Why? Why? Why nothing has happened? And very similar here, they basically refer to the problem of uh, cent the central role of power, uh, dogmatic political economic hegemony and influential vested interests to narrow techno-economic mindsets. So that includes researchers as well, by the way, and ideologies of control. So clearly, you know, um, in uh, ingrained um, procedures, uh, vested interests, and that that just cements what we are doing. Uh, Antonio Guterres is always very good for a quote. Um, 
I thought, by the way, that he brilliantly summarized the three IPCC reports in just one sentence each. Um, he is uh, just a master of the, the, the short quote. And here, thanks, uh, Oliver, for that slide. Uh, he basically says that the actual radicals are not the climate activists that are sometimes depicted as radicals, but the, the other countries that are still increasing the production of fossil fuels. Now, that's a very pointed statement, and there is um, certainly a lot of truth in that. But what I would say is that there is something uh, that, that it would be wrong just to blame the fossil fuel companies and corrupt governments because there are more forces at play. Something much more insidious is really at play here. And that brings me to our paper, The Scientist's Warning on Effluence. Uh, and I will show a few slides on that. Um, what we found there, so it was a literature review basically on, you know, what's going on here in terms of what's driving greenhouse gas emissions and other environmental impacts. And we basically identified three main areas that are interlinked and that reinforce each other, economic growth, inequality, and overconsumption. So overconsumption and effluence, which are driven by economic growth and positional consumption, which means, you know, uh, that uh, people tend to compare themselves with their peers, with others, with their neighbors, and so on, uh, that, that this actually drives um, consumption and environmental impacts, and it does so disproportionately. So in terms of inequality, the top 10% of income earners are responsible for 25 to 43% of environmental impact. So yeah. that's not just greenhouse gases, that's, that's other impacts as well. Sorry, was there a question? Half of the aviation emissions are caused by the top 1% yeah. of income earners. I didn't understand everything, I just understood top 1%. And maybe we leave questions to the end because I think we would run out of time otherwise. What is oh, that's Oliver. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Opinion? It was just a bit of an acoustic problem right. there. Um, yeah. So, so you will find different statistics probably. Um, one striking, another one is that 1% of the top income earners uh, produce half of the global uh, aviation emissions. So that's another really interesting finding. By the way, every one of us listening to this, I guess, I'm not 100% sure, but I guess that we are all in within the 10% range because um, Australia is a wealthy country compared to global standards. And so we, we are all, we are all, you know, the, the effluent persons who, who, um, who, who use up um, <laughs> the resources. Um, but also, you know, so when you look a bit further and dig deeper, the idea that we could decouple environmental impact from economic growth is bound to fail. Um, that is quite clear when you look at what happened, you know, the graph that I showed before for greenhouse gas emissions, what happened over the last 30 years, or you can do this for 50 years or longer, um, that there is just no such decoupling. A um, couple of slides on decoupling just to clarify exactly what we mean here. So that's basically basically the idea that we could continue to grow economies so have rising GDP, but at the same time reduce environmental impacts or resource use. Um, if uh, that's growing slower, but still growing, then we would call it relative decoupling. If it's actually falling, we would call it absolute decoupling, and that's what we are striving for. But we would actually have to have sufficient absolute decoupling to get below our planetary boundaries, right? We would have to reduce emissions fast enough and, and other impacts so that we actually get back to within planetary boundaries. So in the paper, we have this graph which shows just three lines. Um, again, global gross domestic product, that's the orange line. And then we have the blue dotted line are the global CO2 emissions from fossil fuel and industry. And you can see there's relative decoupling. So relative decoupling is happening. And some countries have actually absolute decoupling. So Australia, USA, some European countries, there are some 20 or so, and that's all in the IPCC report that has actually achieved absolute decoupling. But at the global level, this is still going up. Um, there's, it's only relative, it's not sufficient. There's no way um, uh, that, that, that this is fast enough. And then if you look at other things, and this just as a proxy for other 
Other environmental impacts, we have here listed the global material footprint, which is basically total global use of raw materials that just grows in line with GDP. There's no decoupling whatsoever. There's a couple of publications on this. That's just one report that came out from the European Environmental Bureau. Uh, Timothy Parik uh, the co uh, first authored that. He's, he's very active in the degrowth field. And they looked at different um, environmental impacts and found that there is no, either no decoupling at all or insufficient decoupling as for greenhouse gas emissions. So, um, yeah, the, the paper that I referred to and, and Oliver referred to, if you don't want to look at the at the actual scientific paper, there's this um, conversation article as well. And I'm just showing this because um, my, my co-author Julia, or our co-author Julia, the, she found this picture and I found this picture just just very, very telling. I thought this is this is just excellent. Um, you know, when you look at consumerism and and how how the relation between consumerism and and the environment, natural environment is, then I think this picture says it all. Um, again, Oliver, you sent me a, a paper here which um, uh, I didn't know, but um, that uh, was just published, you know, a um, couple of months ago, where they looked at the willingness of uh, people to reduce their travel consumption in the, you know, relation with COVID-19. And uh, they found that affluence represents a major barrier to low carbon transition, because people who are affluent still want to travel, they, they don't actually want to give up their travel. So so that is a real, a real barrier, right? Flying is, is a, is a uh, uh, case in point. Um, so policies must address overconsumption associated with affluence as a priority, which brings me to possible responses, uh, mostly policy responses. I had the slide, I, I, I wanted to say possible solutions, but I don't think that solutions is the right word because solutions, um, th there is no one solution, there's no silver bullet. Um, there are responses and that might help. Um, solutions will have to come from many, many um, different things. So um, the IPCC for the first time included a specific chapter on what is called demand side mitigation and found that reducing demand and consumption can save between 40 and 70 to 70% of emissions in 2050. So that's very substantial. We are talking about things like walking and cycling, active and public transport, less flying, of course, sharing living space and products, plant-based diets, and so on and so on. So all of this together, which would amount to profound lifestyle changes if people were to do that um, and um, would, would actually lead to uh, substantive reductions. Not, you know, it's not sufficient, but it, it's a big part. So, but they also say that it would require systemic changes across all of society. Now, why is this relevant in the context of the IPCC when you assume that there is less demand or maybe even less economic growth, or maybe even no economic growth, then um, all the mitigation challenges are very clearly reduced. And that's very, you know, that's very simple, straightforward, it's common sense. If you use less, for example, less energy, then you need less solar panels or fossil fuels or whatever it might need to generate your um, uh, <clears throat> your energy. So, of course, then everything becomes easier. But um, what, what is common sense to, to most of us is not necessarily what people are looking at. So that just very briefly, I don't want to spend too much time on that, but that's, that's all the IPCC scenarios. As I said before, all of them are assuming negative emissions um, are necessary to, so, so that we can limit global warming. And um, Lawrence Kaiser and Manfred Lenzen uh, together have, have uh, shown that um, if you assume degrowth, I'll talk a bit more about that, but basically no economic growth or shrinking uh, gross domestic product, then only then you would actually be able to get to scenarios that are all in this range where you would need not so much or, or none uh, even uh, negative your carbon dioxide removal. So if we assume um, a degrowth scenario, then we would not have to rely on high energy GDP decoupling, on large scale carbon dioxide removal, or high speed renewable energy transformation. 
which is what all the other scenarios assume. And the reason is that all the other scenarios assume continued economic growth of 2 to 3% per year. That, that was just a given. Um, but now we're starting to see that people are thinking outside you know, the box and assuming that maybe, maybe we need to change that thinking. Um, Mark Diesendorf, our uh, colleague from UNSW, did uh, some modeling on his own, and he basically confirmed that you know, there's no way we, we are able to achieve halving of global emissions, CO2 emissions by 2030 with technological change alone. We would basically also have to halve our energy consumption. And in order to do that, or achieve that, we need policies that reduce global energy consumption. And basically, that's only possible with a degrowth economy. So coming back to our paper, to solve the problem, we need to end overconsumption and, and overproduction, by the way, which is also a feature of capitalist economies that they tend to overproduce. And then, you know, um, with advertising, make us consume more. Um, it basically means we need to get away from economic growth, from that metric and, and from the idea. So degrowth um, is basically a deliberate downscaling of the physical throughput of energy and materials in the wealthiest countries. So the idea is that that those countries that have that are developed that they should do this. Um, developing countries is a different story. So a degrowth does not suggest that everyone should reduce. Um, and uh, yeah, and then uh, there are a few different proposals. I, I'll have a slide on that, but all of them ignore GDP and that ignoring GDP is what we need to do. So that's not new at all. Even um, Simon Kuznets, who invented GDP in the 1930s, almost 100 years ago, said it should not be used as a measure of welfare. Bob F. Kennedy in 1968 had a very influential and, and very interesting speech about um, GNP or GDP. It's, it's uh, uh, effectively the same, uh, where he said it measures everything except that which makes life worthwhile. Um, that, that speech, if you don't know it, um, there's the link uh, well, I can give you the link. It's it's really uh, very interesting to to read. So so we know that you know just measuring economic activity is not what we should be doing. And if you correct GDP uh, by um, you know the detrimental environmental impacts like pollution or detrimental social factors like poverty, if you subtract that from the GDP, everything that's bad. And if you account for the actual indicators that contribute to well-being, then uh, one of those indicators that does that, the genuine progress indicator, actually shows that we have, you know, um, already decades ago, we have flattened that curve so that actually human well-being has not increased. Um, it increases up to a certain point, and that is true for developing countries, for example, but then it flattens out. So for developed countries, we are just not, you know, uh, making good progress. I'll speed this up a little bit. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to show this slide, which is a visualization of uh, the Sun Cable project, which is not realized yet, but which is how it could look like in the Northern Territory. You know about this. Um, and the reason why I wanted to show this is, you know, that um, uh, when, we, when we are getting to this scale, and we know that that this scale is required if we really want to fully decarbonize our economies, then um, that then that this is just gigantic. And uh, the, of course, there will be other impacts as well. You know, we we might be able to pull this off and and reduce our emissions um, substantially. But of course, you need land area, you need the materials to do that, you need an industry, and you need um, you need economic growth to really pull this off. So your colleague, um, and, and I don't need to, to, to say much about that because you know that um, as you looked at the uh, aluminium requirements, for example, um, of the renewable energy transition, if, if you really go to the terawatt scale, I think we have just surpassed one terawatt. Um, you probably know this better than I. And I think the predictions are that we need something like 70 terawatt um, to, to get to, you know, to limit global warming. Um, so, um, a project at this scale just need massive inputs, material inputs, and and the aluminium in this case, so it's just one example. You know, needs needs to be produced with 
something. And if it if that something is not renewable energy, then it, it there are CO2 emissions. And that's the case with everything, with electric cars, with 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 power lines, with um with wind energy, with everything. So um to really uh, ensure that this doesn't blow our carbon budget is difficult if we if we relentlessly keep on growing. Another study uh, just briefly looked at biodiversity impacts of large large scale renewable energy projects and found that um, the threats uh, imposed by mining for all the materials that we need may surpass those threats averted by climate change mitigation. So again, the scale of potential impacts is is uh, large, probably too large, one could say. So coming back to policy proposals again and to what we could do. So I mentioned already there are different ones. Um, they have different names. A growth basically means agnostic to growth. So just don't look at GDP, which I think is a good idea. Post growth is, you know, getting 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 past um, this point. Managing uh, without growth is pretty much the same. Steady state economy, degrowth, they all ignore GDP and they focus on environmental and social well-being. So uh, the idea here is, and that brings me to the donut economy, which you probably he have heard uh, about as well, is to prioritize um, ecological well-being and social well-being. So the donut economy basically suggests, and this was introduced by Kate Rayworth in 2017, that we should uh, not fall below a social foundation. That is, we have certain social indicators that we need to meet, like good health, good food and so on and so on like education so we should we should achieve that but we should also not go beyond an ecological ceiling so we should not surpass our planetary boundaries so basically we should try and keep our economies our lifestyles within the donut here within that green band and in the paper, we summarized all the approaches that we could find by the time so that there's a table which which can be summarized as follows. Um, when you look at the different proposals, then we, we have categorized them into reformist approaches, which are a bit more moderate, uh, you might say, and radical approaches. So the reformist approaches pursue uh, those, th those ideas here. Basically, they say they assume that necessary changes are compatible with existing centralized states and capitalism can be achieved with... Um, and, and with reform so that um, the systems that we currently have can be reformed with strong environmental limits and social justice and policies. Um, an example of that is the well-being economy, and I have a couple of slides on that as well. More radical approaches say, well, um, we probably have to uh, implement more radical changes. We have to increase the social control over uh, political and economic processes. So um, that puts more emphasis on grassroots um, with either with a democratic state, so you would call this eco-socialism, or without this um, state, you would call this eco-anarchism, um, but uh, putting more emphasis on participatory democratic movements and so on. So um, examples here are individuals who do this by themselves, transition initiatives, eco-villages, who just basically decouple themselves from the economic system. So practical policies that have been suggested or trialed, uh, shorter working week, uh, strong social and environmental policies, universal basic income or services to help with inequality, stabilizing population, uh, ideally decreasing population, and then investment in green infrastructure, of course, more local, localized manufacturing. I'll, I'll skip this in the interest of time. That was some modeling done by Graham Turner, who basically said, yeah, um, only, you know, if we achieve these things, we can actually avoid collapse. Again, Mark Diesendorf had um, uh, published that in the conversation. His idea is very similar. He, he adds taxes is important, like carbon tax or in, in environmental taxes, job sharing, um, and then, of course, um, <clears throat> the other proposals. Um, so a few slides now, just briefly, um, how this has been taken up around the world, the idea that we could, you know, decrow or, or different 
um, systems. So this was published a website by the Friends of the Earth in Europe uh, just two months ago or so, where they basically said the disease is the growth-based economy and the treatment is uh, basically tackling overconsumption and uh, developing models that are not continuous in economic growth. The IPCC is very conservative, as you know, in, especially in terms of policy recommendations. You will not find specific policy recommendations in the summary for policymakers because that's not what the IPCC does. But um, the word degrowth is mentioned 15 times in Working Group 2 report, and it's mentioned also in the mitigation report. And so it's acknowledged that there are ideas that um, you know, might, might help with mitigation. Um, European Environment Agency has come out with a, so that's the body that advises EU uh, politicians and, and decision-making bodies on policies. They came out with a briefing on growth without economic growth, um, where they basically, you know, um, say that decoupling may not be possible, that post-growth and degrowth are alternatives to mainstream economics that uh, offer valuable insights, um, and that this is something worth pursuing. And they also put out um, the different scenarios. Yeah, they're imagining sustainable futures for Europe. They have different scenarios. One of them is called Ecotopia, imaginary four. And that's basically a degrowth scenario where there is, where it basically says technology plays a role, but is not the, the solution by itself. Consumption and resource use are being scaled back. And, um, you know, that uh, bottom-up decision-making processes become more important. So the European Union or in Europe, there is a good discussion already going on. Even the OECD, the OECD, as you know, the wealthiest countries in the world, um, normally uh, the proponents of strong economic growth um, have you know, on their website in, in a report, in this report, uh, conceded that um, we will not uh, meet the challenges using the tools of the last century and that we will probably have to think about um, something else than growth. Um, I'll, I'll skip that one in the interest of time. Um, uh, although just the headline by itself, only radical is realistic now. That's uh, a think tank from Germany who basically say we should do more carbon rationing. That's the only thing that helps now. Uh, but uh, another proposal, the Wellbeing Economy, the Wellbeing Alliance, uh, is, an, is a partnership of governments that basically uh, share expertise and transfer policies that are um, good for the environment and for society. So the, the emphasis really here is not on economic growth. It basically says it doesn't matter what happens to economic growth, but what matters is uh, that we have a, um, a good environment and good social policies. And uh, there, there is this movement, there is an alliance, and there are five governments that are currently implementing this actively. And if you look at those countries, Scotland, New Zealand, Iceland, Wales, and Finland, you might notice, you might know that uh, four of those five countries, all uh, except Wales, are governed by women. And I leave the interpretation of that fact to you. Um, in uh, New South Wales and in Australia, um, a white paper came out in April um, in New South Wales on a well-being budget for New South Wales. So this is basically looking at different um, spheres of well-being from individuals to societal well-being, uh, which puts a strong imperative for ecological and social sustainability. So that um, talks about indicators measuring things like happiness, life satisfaction, wellness, and so on and so on. Uh, so this is uh, a good idea uh, to implement. And in fact, um, at the federal level, Jim Chalmers introduced, uh, will introduce a chapter on well-being in his new budget. So this is a small step, but it, it's actually, or maybe you could say it's a big step because that's the first time something like this will be included, where uh, there will be metrics on well-being and not just on economic growth. And yeah, actually, I think it, it might, it's actually um, a big step because it, it does change, you know, the, uh, the, the existing paradigm. So I'm just conscious of time. Um, what next?
from our paper, we basically said, you know, um, the, there's a need to focus on sufficiency lifestyles. So how can we change? Uh, how can we get away from overconsumption and from economic growth? And uh, we had a, a number of questions listed here that could help to uh, overcome some barriers um, of transformation. Uh, what can we learn from bottom-up movements, for example? What can we learn from indigenous societies? Um, what does it mean for the global south? So there are so many questions that that we can ask. Um, this paper here that, that I mentioned already, why haven't we bent the global emissions curve? They also have really good summary points, which I can recommend. They do uh, point to the fact that we need something like social imaginaries that really help us to in, uh, visualize and vision uh, a future that, that could get away from economic growth. And at this point, I would like to call out um, the Simplicity Institute. You know, it's just one of the think tanks. It's not the only one, but here in Australia, Samuel Alexander and others have, you know, done uh, really good work in trying to um, demonstrate how life in a degrowth economy could actually look like. So there's this video series on YouTube, but there's also, um, you know, books by Sam and others uh, like a degrowth in the suburbs, uh, suburbs, for example. So there's really good material that helps to um, show how how this could be realized. Um, and of course, there's no question that this is a long process. We um, ended the paper then by calling on the research community to identify and support solutions that will always be multidisciplinary research because that's the only way we can get to solutions by working together across disciplines to uh, for the public to engage in the discussion um, about solutions you know this is the first thing you everyone can do to talk about this and then uh, and then a public discourse arises from that and for the actual decision and policy makers to uh, try and uh, try out a few things, implement solutions like the well-being economy, well-being budget. So th these are certainly things that, that we, we need to be bold. Right, I'll stop here because we I'm sure there are questions, but I thank you very much for listening and a thanks again for the inputs from Oliver and Erin. Um, Oliver is online. Yes, I'm online. So, um, host? Yeah. yeah, okay. Please. So, uh, I'm looking just at the chat window here, and uh, I have got the first question is coming from Louise. Uh, and Louise mm -hmm. asks, what is your view on the concept of sustainability, sustainable economic growth? Is there such a thing? I mean, you kind of partly uh, answered it, but maybe you can add a little bit to that. Oliver, can I add to the question just to sort of yes. yep. not waste time? Yeah. Tommy, thank you so much for your presentation. It's um, really, really um, valuable. I guess my, my question relates to th this thing about, you know, I, I'm in a business school. I mean, is it possible to have growth when you do invest in things like well-being? So we're talking about, you know, pre pre um, child care, early child care, mm -hmm. health, education. Um, do these, won't these, uh, if big investments in them will provide, I imagine will grow the economy. I, I mean, mm -hmm. I'm just a bit confused about how yes. you can have a well-being focus without growth. Yeah, there's always a bit of a trade-off here. And I think the evidence points to the fact that you can um, achieve a certain level of well-being uh, and, and you, you need economic growth for that. So if you start with, at the beginning, if as it were, or with um, developing countries that are, you know, have a much lower level, then clearly um, the best way, at least so far, to achieve, uh, to, to get out of poverty, for example, or to achieve a, a certain level of health and education and well-being is by uh, by growing the economy. So at least that was what, what happened in the past and what, that's why those countries are obviously striving for economic growth. Um, once, once you have reached a certain level and that's somewhere between around the 15 to 20,000 US dollars per person mark um, uh, of, of 
uh, effluence, uh, you, you see that leveling off that you then actually, that, that then the negative impacts uh, start to prevail. And so then you get the trade off that um, uh, you have other environmental impacts. And currently there was a study that looked at all countries in the world and found that none of them uh, would achieve all the social targets like the social um, parts of the sustainable development goals, for example, without transgressing uh, at least one of the boundaries. Um, I think the best countries they had were Sri Lanka and Vietnam, who achieved uh, a decent level and did not cross too many boundaries, but there was no country that achieved, you know, um, all the good things and didn't have the bad things. So, um, yes, a certain level of investment and growth is probably necessary to achieve certain um, a certain status. Um, but that status is much lower than what we have in developed countries. So developed countries, you know, I, I, I don't know the exact numbers, but we are probably something like 50, 60,000 US dollars per person on average. Um, and, and so we are several times, like four times higher than we, we would have to be. Um, and uh, and that's why the suggestion that you know uh, we in the developed countries at least we we can scale back and we have to scale back. Um, yeah, I hope that makes sense. There's more in the chat. I don't sorry. know how do so, we yeah sorry sorry yeah. next question was from me but I would like to skip that one to the end mm -hmm. if we still have time and I would like to ask Fiak if you are around if you could actually ask yeah. your question mm -hmm. yeah I mean I really uh, like the talk so thank you very much it's it's great uh, to have you here but I, I had two questions but maybe I, 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 I the first one was we need to build a lot more stuff we need to build uh, you know uh, solar panels wind turbine heat pumps insulated homes all kind of EVs to support the energy transition. So for this, this will mean more growth, not less growth mm. in the short term. So what is your take on that, especially for the global south, mm. which it needs to go through all that themselves? Yeah, so that's that, my first question. Yeah, no, that, that that's it's a good question, and it's actually the 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 actual challenge that we are facing. You know, how can we actually get uh, the energy transition uh, at the scale that we need and at at the speed that we need in order to avoid catastrophic climate change. And um, yeah, the answer is uh, that basically, yes, we need that. And we need it as fast as possible. And there's no doubt that there will have to be investment. And there's no doubt that these sectors of the economy will have to grow, you know, our solar um, energy systems and, and wind and, and those renewables, that sector needs to grow by a factor of 10 or more. There's no question, but at the same time, um, all of, uh, if we expect to just continue with our economic growth and keep the same level of um, uh, lifestyle, we we will fail. We will. It will not be possible to achieve that in time. Uh, so, uh, you know, we need to do both. We need to expand renewable energy, uh, but at the same time, scale uh, back the demand. Um, if you fly less, you need less sustainable aviation fuels. If you, um, you know, drive less, you need less, um, or, or maybe don't drive at all, uh, take your bike, you need less uh, batteries for uh, your electric vehicle. Um, if, yeah, if you, if you insulate your home, you need less um, um, solar panels on your roof. So, um, those scenarios that I've mentioned, uh, the only ones that were, you know, realistic from from an environmental point of view were those that do both uh, rapid transition to renewable energy, but at the same time reducing demand, so much more, being much more efficient about energy and, and just consuming less, and then and then we have a chance. Politically, those scenarios are, are not likely at the moment. Uh, and that's the challenge. But maybe that's your next, next question. Thanks, Alex. That, that, that's a good answer. And uh, Oliver, shall I ask my second question or maybe skip a little bit other people? Are you muted? There are not too How many in the chat, so maybe we can... How about we, we move forward and if there's time, you ask your second question. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. 
Hey, Bronwyn, are you around? Would you want to ask your question? OK, maybe I asked a question then for Bronwyn. Great talk. Thank you so much. I totally agree. Fabulous talk. What do you think uh, would be the most important aspects of a city level donut uh, economy experiment? Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. And, and actually, I'm, I'm, we have a project that looks at city city level uh, environmental footprints and, and how we can stay within planetary boundaries for cities. Um, yeah, <laughs> that, that's a good one. Uh, obviously, you know, at the city level, you can you can implement things. Um, there, there are certain things where you have more control than over others. And one thing where you have control is uh, transport. So doing everything to support active and public transport is certainly a good one. Um, that 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 would also help. Yeah, and, and, and just with planning, you know, if we can avoid um, making trips to work, if we can work from home or if we can work closer to home, if we don't have to drive that far and if we can do that with a bike, then yes, we, we that that makes a very big difference. So transport is one, um, electricity, um, uh, ACT is a good example. They have switched to 100 renewable percent electricity, I think. Um, councils can do more. Where it's a bit difficult is, you know, the, um, the overall level of consumption, because the problem is um, if you earn a certain income, then you, um, which, which you need to live in Sydney, for example, um, then you're going to spend the money. You spend most of it on your mortgage. Um, you can, you know, you can influence that a little bit on where your bank invests and which bank you have. That That makes a big difference, actually. But um, councils cannot do so much about that level of consumption, but they can offer things like um, sharing, tool sharing, material sharing, you know, um, maybe maybe a bit more um, urban agriculture, uh, local food production. Um, yeah, things like that. So this is this is where local governments can maybe uh, try and make a difference. Thank you. Um, and Maybe I can just add a, a real comment is I feel like your talk was, gave us a really great basis for bridging a sort of a technical data-based uh, persuasion case with a, a new narrative and that, you know, Donata Economics is one place where both of those things can happen and you're mm -hmm. sort of pointing the way in really useful ways. So thank you. Okay, thanks. All, all right, so the next question is from Andreas Push. Andreas, are you around at all? If yes, or if you are available to talk. If not, then I'm going to read this question. Have you thought about the, uh, hang on, what is this? Physiocrat approach that starts with the acknowledgement that Earth belongs to all of us and that land should not be owned by individuals. Individuals. To me, it seems that general ecological and human well-being won't be possible without that. So mm. I'm yeah, good point. Um, so, so that was not part of the specific paper of my research, but um, generally, obviously, you know, there is a point that you could make that um, our 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 relationship to nature has changed over the last few decades. We have become more disconnected from nature, and um, we are probably more focusing on our, um, you know. Mm, financial well-being. Uh, we are more in a technocratized uh, world uh, than 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 in nature. Um, one thing we put out as a question is: Is there something we can learn from indigenous communities? You know, uh, those that have lived with nature um, over very very long time periods, and obviously that was. Um, must have been sustainable. Otherwise, it would not have been possible to sustain it over that time period. And uh, I think that's where it overlaps. And yes, there is, uh, yeah, th th there. I know that there is a discussion also going on about just um, whether we we need to change our whole world view. You know, the Westernized world view of how we how we view the world and how our relationship is to to nature. What what how we think we relate to that. Um, I'm not sure whether it, it answers your question, but um, there's certainly this discussion. I think which is important to have as well because uh, many of the drivers of our behavior come from uh, the way we, we we view the world and our relationship with the nat natural world so i think we're coming to the end of the time kai wen do you maybe want to uh, close this 
Or is it okay to go off one more question? Kaiwen, what do you reckon? Um, I think we still can uh, go for another question. I just okay. see the, the question from Howard about war footing. So um, is it a good analogy? Um, that is, do we basically need to um, think as if we were in a war? Uh, in principle, yes, sort of, I would say. Um, at least if you think about the scale of effort that is needed. So during wartime, you know, you say you, you put all the efforts into, well, trying to win the war or defeat the enemy or whatever it might be. Um, it's very interesting what's happening in Germany at the moment because of the war in Ukraine, well, and in other European countries, but Germany is the one that is most reliable on uh, Russian gas, as you know. Um, that gas might not be delivered um, at some point. Uh, winter might be very difficult. Um, so there is, um, and, and there's a new government, red-green government, who want to get away from fossil fuels as well. So, so very difficult decisions that they have to make. Obviously, um, switching to 100% renewables would be the answer, but you can't do that in half a year or in a year. So um, what do you do? You have to ramp up coal-fired power stations again. Um, but uh, what I'm saying, yes, um, when you get into a situation where you ha are confronted with immediate problems where you really need to act fast, then you need to throw everything at it. And that's basically, it, it comes to a warlike effort to combat climate change. You really need to focus all the policies, all the activities onto that one goal. Um, hopefully not forget, forgetting about other goals, but um, yeah, uh, to do that effort. So um, I know that, that some uh, academics have actually written about that, including Mark Diesendorf, who said basically, yes, we need to have a wartime mentality um, when it gets to combating climate change, <clears throat> just because it's so urgent and, and um, yeah, uh, we're running out of time. I think that's a good point. We are running out of time. Yeah. You just said it there. <laughs> <laughs> no to end on. Hey, uh, Kaiwen, maybe you can close. And, and if, if Tommy and Kaiwen, if you could stay on just a tiny little bit afterwards for a very quick debrief, is that possible? Yeah. Sure. That's great. OK, thank you, everyone, for um, attending this uh, great talk. Thanks, Tommy, for the um, uh, presentation. It's great that we have uh, 15 people attended. And uh, I, I see a lot of them from outside the uh, UNSW. That's great. And uh, we will put the uh, video shortly online. You can like promote again, uh, sending to your colleagues, your partnership to see this great talk again. And uh, I can see we still have a few questions we didn't answer. Uh, you can reach to Tommy directly or direct your question to me. I can send to Tommy uh, to answer. Okay, thank you again for attending. Um, see you soon. Thanks everyone.